to you some more about prayer in um, Ephesians chapter 6. But on Sunday mornings, all through the month of January, I'm going to be ministering on the power of all. And we'll be talking about how, um, what a powerful thing that is, the power of everybody. <laughs> all right, are you out here, out there with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10? Ephesians 6, 10, a passage that most of you are probably familiar with about the armor of God. But I'm going to take it in a little bit different way. I probably am not going to emphasize the armor as much as what you're about to hear. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I, may be, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador, I am an ambassador in chains, that, it may, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Be strong in the Lord. You know, several years ago, April and I visited a church um, in another state, you don't need to try to figure it out. and It's not World Revival Church. We had gone to a, a particular church and uh, you know, pretty good praise and worship. And the pastor got up and he ministered and um, really made a call for the people for prayer and seeking God. And, and April and I were really moved. And at the end of the he made a call for, every, you know, for people to come and respond to it. And I just thought, man, the whole church is going to come down. And it was April and me. And Mark and Darla Miller, and I think their kids. I don't think anyone else even came. But yeah, well, but yeah, our family, Bailey. And it was like I'm thinking, what? What is that? I, I, I mean, I was baffled because I thought good service, good message. The people are just going to, you know, blow that place apart and go down and and seek after God. And I mean, and the service was over in. A moment after that and it, what was there probably 800 people there I mean there was several hundred people there but what that tells me about the body of Christ and it isn't just there is that there's a lot of talk about prayer and a lot of talk about you know revival and seeking and all that and really and I think in the body of Christ in America a lot of it's just talk it's just we, we talk about it but when it comes down to doing the stuff When it, when it comes down to, to really doing the stuff, it, it gets quiet in the, in the body of Christ. Or the, the response is almost like crickets chirping. You know, it's like, oh, no one's planning on doing this, are they? They're just talking about it. No one plans to pray. No one plans to really intercede. No one plans on getting it out. And honestly, um, I'm not just trying to toot our horn, but maybe I am. This church for decades has prayed with guts and there was there was one time we started prayer and fasting and it went 120 days yeah. that was i don't know how many years ago was that probably 15 16 years ago 120 days and we're talking about every morning every night i mean every night it wasn't we sundays saturdays <laughs> uh tuesdays um so there has been that kind of heart and that kind of prayer for a long time. And the Lord did tell me to tell us 
in this church that this is an important time for us. This is an important time that we not uh, bypass this, that this is an opportunity in a big way for us. Now, in this passage, um, Paul says, Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Now, why does he say that? Obviously, it's because we need to be strong in the power of his might. We need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might because the other side is we won't be strong. And how do, how do we do that? He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Everybody say that out loud. Say the power of his might. We are to be mighty people. We are to be powerful people, strong in the things of God. And there's a reason for that. Because he says in the next verse, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand or able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Um, and most of you know, if you've been around me very long in this church, we're not devil chasers. We're not seeing a devil behind every bush. However, I think that a lot of times that we don't really take this to heart, this passage, in that a lot of the things that we view and we see, I'm talking about this church and the body of Christ at large, and those of you that are watching via streaming, we in, in general, we attack symptoms rather than getting to the real root of what's going on. You know, like if a doctor looks at you and he says, man, you've got this and this and this and this, and I'm going to give you these pain relievers. Well, I mean, you, I guess you might feel better. You might feel real good after he gives you all those pain you know, relievers. But, you know, the fact of the matter is you've just masked something. You haven't really got to the core and the root of what's causing this whatever it is, to come out. And I think sometimes in, in praying, we're looking at, well, look at this, look at that. And we're moved by all these symptoms that are going on. You know, for instance, if you listen to Christian talk radio, I mean, it's constant. You know, this is happening in Washington, D.C., and this is happening, and that's happening, and, and, and they're talking about all of these symptoms. And this is not an accusation against them necessarily, but at the same time, a lot of times I think that we're majoring so much on these different things that are going on instead of just realizing that the problem here is not what we see. The problem is not what we're viewing. The problem is that we're wrestling with something else. Because he, he goes on to say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So the indication here is, is that the fight is really on a spiritual level. We're fighting on a spiritual level. There may be, like, like April was feeling prompted of the Lord, and I'm so glad that she said something, because I felt like we need to come down here and do something. I wasn't quite sure what we needed to do, but I felt like we needed to come to the front tonight as well. And... Um, we can see things going on in marriages, for instance. And we, we've got a situation with uh, someone really close to us that are struggling. And, you know, I mean, what's really going on here? We can say, well, we, you know, we see this and we see that. And maybe just looking at the outward symptom that's going on. Yet what's really happening here? What's, what is a spiritual root? Because really, if you trace most anything, there really is a spiritual root. And the remedy of it is to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I mean, that's really it. Be strong in him. Be strong in him. You say, oh, so I just be strong and all my problems will go away. Well, your problems are not going, away, not going to go away if you're not strong in him. And the fact of the matter is, if you are strong in him, you'll be able to see with eyes and hear with ears and perceive with a mind that isn't just looking at what is. You're piercing behind the curtain and being able. And you know, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything, the devil's down there, you know, like the Wizard of Oz, you know, behind curtains, pulling. But yet, you know, and I don't want to overplay that, but I don't want to underplay it either. I don't want to underplay this to think that he's not working and moving and maneuvering. 
And again, the fact is, if we're strong in the Lord and the power of his might, there's some things that the devil tries to do that you just run over. You know, he's, he's not, he is not powerful. He's just a deceiver. I mean, you realize that, don't you? He's not powerful. He doesn't have power over you. He's just a deceiver. The devil doesn't come in and go, ah, I'm big, I'm strong, I'm mighty, I'm taking over here. All you have to say is, get out of here. Get it. I mean, as long as you realize who he is and what he is, he doesn't have power or strength over you. But the fact of the matter is, you have to understand when it's him showing up. He showed up in the garden. He didn't come in, you know, say, I'm the devil and I've come to take over. He came saying, let's have a talk. Let's visit together. I mean, what did, what did Satan do to Jesus? Again, he didn't come, you know, as the big boogeyman. He came and said, are you hungry? You're the son of God. I think you ought to turn these rocks into bread. I mean, it's just conversation. He's, he's addressing and he's, he's trying to pull in and, ingratiate and and get you and and me just to have a little conversation with him isn't that how gossips are gossips will never tell you i've come to deceive you and i've i've come to to say bad things from the devil to you they come as a friend to discuss (laughs) or they might even be your prayer partner (laughs) right Listen, I don't like to gossip, but we really need to pray. Here, so here we go. And under the guise of prayer, we've got this kind of stuff. But you, have, but you see, if you're strong in the Lord and the power of his might, that kind of thing, those kinds of things showing up, you just go, this isn't my life. This is not what I do. This is not who I am. Right? And so... Um, and then he, he begins to talk about in here uh, that you're going to be able, if you'll do this, if you'll be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, that you're going to be able to withstand in the evil day. Now, look, this doesn't just mean the end times, that evil day, which it could. I mean, <laughs> there's going to be an evil, 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 evil day, right? And yet you may be living in an evil, evil, evil day. We're living in a country today, it is amazing to me, just amazing to me, how slippery and slimy the devil really is. You know, I read the newspaper today, and, and one there was a guy that, that wrote something about uh, the immorality in our country, and he addressed homosexuality, but it wasn't the only thing. It was, there were several things that he was addressing. It was in the editorial section. Very good article, cited scripture after scripture after scripture, and, and it got me stirred up enough that I looked them all up and read them, and I thought, yeah, that's, wow, that's good stuff. Well, someone else writes the next day, debunking it all, and it is, it's amazing to me, and he used scripture to, to twist the very things that this other person had cited, and, and did it so well, did it so articulately, But at the end of the day, what he was saying is that immorality is okay because love trumps all. You know, isn't it amazing that that we live in a society today that, you know, just (laughs) that that we're just so accepting of everything. You know, we just we just embrace everybody and everything and everyone's sin and everyone's fallop and that doesn't mean that we don't love people but you know what jesus loved people and yet he he went in and told people the way that it was and you know when you get to romans this this guy was really beaten down on romans and and putting his story putting his twist to it and i thought and i'm boy i'm real tempted to write my own article in rebuttal to it uh, because at the end of the day if you read what he says in romans one he says he gave him over to a reprobate mind <laughs> they're reprobates I mean, if I called you a reprobate, you would be offended, wouldn't you? But it, it is offensive. And, it's what, and the Bible says that when they didn't want God in their knowledge, he gave them over to a reprobate mind. So if you don't want God in your knowledge, then you have the potential of going way out there and away from the things of God. You say, what's this got to do with what you're talking about? It's being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We have to let the word of God just be the rule. We let it be the rule, period. I'm against divorce because the Bible is. 
I, I don't think that, that we ought to be, you know, running around, you know, getting, you know, multiple partners because I'm tired of this one or tired of that one or just, and now I'm not here to condemn anyone that has had failed in that area. You know, if I did that, the whole church would leave. <laughs> but, you know, but the fact is, is that we need to stay on the side of marriage because God stays on that side. That's just what we do. And we do anything and everything that we can to help people stick it out and work it out because it's the right thing to do. If people fail, we don't kick them in the seat and say, you're no good bum, we don't want to ever talk to you again, you're a failure. We, we still embrace people, but we, we, never, we never ever, in the name of love, say everything is okay because everything's not okay. It's just not. And it never will be because it's not for your good for everything to be okay. It's not helpful to you for everything to be okay. It's not helpful for us to say, well, it's okay that you're like that. After all, God loves you. Well, and that's a moot point. Everybody knows God loves you, right? But that's not being strong in the Lord and the power of his might just to throw up in the name of love. Everything is okay because God is love. The, the trump card is love. That, you know, there's, a, there, there's some things that we call love that are actually hurtful. Well, you know, I love my kids so much, I don't want to be telling them no. Well, they're playing out in the street with busy cars. Well, they, you know, if I do that, if they're going to, it's going to hurt them. It's going to upset them. They like playing in the street with, in, with cars, you know, whizzing by at 60 miles an hour. And I, I don't want to upset them. I love them. Really. Let them drink Clorox. My kid loves, he loves to smell Clorox and, you know, just put, I mean, <laughs> And you're laughing because it's ridiculous, but it's, it's the same kind of thing that we're, we, in the name of love, in the church, are allowing some things to, to slip away from us and not hold a standard in the name of being accepting. And we can't take that tact. We want to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And you know what? Being strong in the Lord and the power of His might is to be forgiving, right we never say that this is okay but what we do say if you fail we're still going to embrace you you're our family we're, we're going to pull you right in we're going to stick with you we're going to stand with you we're going to believe with you we're not going to say good boy you did great but we're going to say we love you come on let's see if god can heal us in this and make us better and maybe repair, maybe restore, if that's possible. If we can't restore, then let's repair. Let's, but let's go after God. Let's keep being strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Is anybody out there? So, um, it, Paul says we're wrestling with something. And it's not flesh and blood. It's not the outward thing that you see. There's something deeper. I don't know how many times in working with people, in my own experience, and um, you know, the older you get, I think the more you see this, um, that you you see people that fail and you know in my younger days a lot of times I would just say man get over it just move on just what what's the matter with you can't you just take but you know some people have got something deep-seated working in them that and that if, if you can understand it and see it rather than hitting all the outward things you may need to get in there with them and help them and and talk through and that doesn't mean that you just constantly i mean I've, I've got i mean we've all met people where it just seems like they don't want to get better but if someone wants to get better they ought to have the chance and we ought to work with them and stay with them and and understand that sometimes what we've really got working here is a wrestling with principalities and powers we're wrestling with something if there's something repeated in someone's life it's more than likely that they're re wrestling with something that is beyond what you see now, you know, the psychiatrist would say, well, it's their mom, it's their dad. And, you know, maybe I don't think we can not deny that everyone in this room has been affected by parents and how they've been raised or someone, something, circumstances in our lives. And yet a lot of times those things become the strongholds in our life. Those things become the strongholds in our life. And um, so we need to understand that if people are struggling with something that's over and over and over, we may need to get to the root of it. We're not struggling with just 
this, we're struggling with something unseen. Now, one of the ways, though, that we defeat this and work through this is staying strong in the Lord, the power of his might, that we can make our stance in the evil day. Now, so then Paul begins to, to give us the weapons of our warfare, the armor of God. And he, first of all, he talks about truth. The reason I mentioned a moment ago just about that little thing in the newspaper is the only way that you can rebut something like that is to know the truth. Look, if you don't know the Word of God, you won't get to, the, get to first base on anything that I'm talking about. You've got to have some working knowledge of what is right and what's wrong. And when you know that, then you aren't constantly having to go to the Lord and say, well, what about this or what about that? I mean, there's some things we already know. We know things about immorality. We know that the works of the flesh and what the works of the Spirit are and what the works of the Spirit are. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. But then he talks about the things of the flesh. He, he talks about uh, immorality and lasciviousness, hate, um, animosity, um, unforgiveness. Um, talks about homosexuality. It talks about, uh, and those are works of the flesh. They're just, and, and so we don't have to pray about that. So in order to be strong in the Lord and have some working basis from which to pray, we've got to have the truth. Having your loins girded, or your waist girded, the King James says, your loins girded with truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, just knowing what is right and what is good, but also knowing who you are. You know who you are. You, you have your breastplate of righteousness on, and that you can make your stance and even pray. Some, of, you know, some people still struggle, and I guess you're never going to get really very far in prayer unless you know who you are in Christ? Do you not know that you have a right to make a stance? I mean, what gives April the audacity to, for her to get up here tonight and say, let's make a square tonight and let's just speak and say our God reigns over every situation, no matter what you're facing if it, or, or someone you know what they're facing and you make that. I mean, if you don't know who you are in Christ that you can stand and say, you know what, we've had enough of this. I know who I am in the Lord. I know what I've gotten from him. I'm going to make my stance tonight. I'm going to begin to speak and I'm going to begin to say, I'm going to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's what I'm going to do. But you see, how do you do that? How do you have the audacity to stand and say, in Jesus' name, I bind this situation. I command it to be broken by the powerful name of Jesus. How do you do that? What kind of a person does that? A person knows who they are. Righteousness. They will stand in their place and they will pray with some kind of vicious authority because they know this is our territory. This is our territory. I know what the Lord's given us. April last night was laying down and I can, you can read her pretty well. And she, I said, what's the matter? And she said, well, my chest. A lot of times she didn't want to say anything because she's not a complainer and she didn't even like to profess it. But she, uh, kind of over the years, she's had, every once in a while, something lands on her chest and it just twists in there. Well, what do I do? Well, what's my first response? Well, you want to go to the hospital? Do you want to? Uh... But that's a lot of people's their first response is always that. Medicine, doctor, shot. My first response is, let's pray. And I just began to speak over her and began to pray. And I stopped. She said, keep doing it. It's working it. It's wor she said, keep doing it. It's working. And so I just stayed with it for a while and, and kept praying in the spirit and rebuking and binding. I said, how are you doing? She said, much better. But you know, how do you know to do that? Am I a hot shot? Uh, trust me. No, but I tell you what I do know. I know who I am in Christ. I know what I've got and I know what I can speak and I know what I can do. In him. And that's the breastplate of righteousness. Knowing your spot, knowing your place, and you've got something that's impenetrable. The gospel of peace on your feet. It ought to be that, that you're a peaceful person. That when you show up, peace starts happening. And, you know, if that's not working for you, if, look, if, if you've got constant turmoil, there's, there's some kind of 
demonic something going on here. And, and you may need to get at the root of, of it. And who knows? Spirit of division, spirit of, of deceits, uh, just uh, spirit of contention. But look, and a lot of time, that doesn't take a lot of discerning to see that. If you have constant turmoil where you are, there's something going on other than everywhere you go, your bosses are bad. Or everywhere you go, those dirty churches that I've been in. Or everywhere I go, those people don't like, well, hmm, everywhere, everywhere them, everywhere them, everywhere them, everywhere them. Really? Wow. Wow. What is that? Possibly there's a spirit working here. Because we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. We're, not, we're working with something else. Hello? Spirits of poverty. Chronic poverty. Just You find yourself always being in lack. You say, and it may be, it may be generational. It may be that it, it stems back from your great-grandmother, grandmother, grandmother grandfather and all of them had it had that on them well even if it is there's a spirit working here that needs to be broken we're not wrestling with flesh and blood we are wrestling with principalities and power spirits that are trying to push down shove down but a lot of this can be alleviated by knowing who you are that's why he says be strong in the lord and the power of his might there is a remedy to winning in these things and that's knowing who you are having your breastplate Knowing the truth, faith, quenching fiery darts of the wicked one. When, when the enemy, and I believe it's the enemy, when he starts shooting darts at April's chest and starts making that, that thing happen in her chest, well, what did she need at that moment? She needed to some, someone to come up alongside her and start helping to quench some darts. Now, knowing her, she's already doing that. She's not one to sit around, oh, oh, boom, boom. Boom. She'd be very likely to be fighting and speaking and saying herself. Because in general, April is really a more positive person than me. <laughs> There's a lot of times stuff will happen and she'll say, no, come on, let's get over on this side. And of course, what do I do? Get behind me, woman, I'm in charge here. <laughs> no, you know, I, I recognize that. And it's really... Really, honestly, it kind of in that the Briscoe vein, it, it there tends to be kind of a undercurrent of pessimistic kind of, and and so I have to. You say, well, that's the devil. Well, yeah, it probably is. I admit it. It's a, it's a devil working through you know that lineage, and um, so. If you can recognize it, though, and you start working against it, you realize that there are some areas in your life that are actually satanic. <laughs> so that means, oh, you got a devil. No, it just means that the, that the enemy is working through and with my weaknesses, wherever they might be, no matter how they come. He doesn't care how they come, just as long as you got them. He'll, he'll exploit them to the end. And you say, well, is that really right? Well, look at Paul. You know, when, when you look at him, there's, I love Paul. He's, other than Jesus, Paul's my second favorite. And then David um, in the Old Testament. I love him because he's God's iron man. I just like that. I like, he's kind of like the John Wayne in the spirit, you know? Just tough and strong. And, and, and with Paul, there's not any middle ground. It's this or that. It's, it's not, you know, he, he even confronts Peter, you know, the Pope. He, he confronts him. That was a joke. He, he confronts him and openly, too. He says, you know, what, what kind of a guy are you? You know, we're, here we are, fellowshipping with the Gentiles, the Jewish Christians, the Jewish Gentile, or Jewish uh, Christians that are trying to get the Gentiles to compromise in the faith and come more on the Jewish side. He said, you know, here you were being just like everybody else until they come along, and when they come along, you drop these guys, run over there. What is this? What is this? This is not right. So that's very admirable, isn't it? He, he's like that. I mean, when he's a, a 
not a Christian. He's trying to kill every Christian he can find. And when he becomes saved, he's going to build a church in every city he can get to. It's just the way he is. He's all out. It's all or nothing. And I like that. I think that's what Christianity is. I think it's a great example. But it has its downside. Here's Paul's Iron Man. He's got Barnabas, who's, who's this probably sweet, sweetest teddy bear in the Bible. He's the grace guy. And, and so John Mark goes with him. He's you know Barnabas' relative, and, and he's, they're going in there doing missionary work. And John Mark says, I'm, 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 this is too hard. I want to go home. And I'm paraphrasing, but they, I, I want to go home. Paul says, get. Baby, get! He didn't say that either. I'm just the way I'm kind of thinking, the way it happened. And so when they go back out to visit the churches where they'd gone before, Barnabas says, "Hey, let's take John Mark with us." And Paul says, "Over my dead body, that little—he's—he's he's a wimp. He's not going with us. He deserted us when we were out on the trail. He's not going with." Us. And Barnabas says, "You know, this is all paraphrase. It's not really in the Bible, but you can kind of get the inference of it." That Barnabas says, "Hey, come on, let the grace of God work here. He's grown up. He's more mature. Let him come." No, he's not coming with us. He's a wimp, baby. And Barnabas, says, look, give him a ch- no. So they split. And, of course, many people would say, well, yeah, you never heard of Barnabas again, do you? Well, that's because Luke travels with Paul, and so he writes about the things that Paul did. I don't know what Barnabas did, but let me tell you this. There is no Paul without a Barnabas. If you don't get Barnabas, you don't get Paul. Barnabas is the one that pulled Paul right into the kingdom of God and who wrote half, over half the New Testament. And besides that, I think Barnabas was right, because guess who wrote the Gospel of Mark? Huh? He wrote the wrote the guy. Yeah, and then then later on, Paul says, "Hey, bring John Mark. He's profitable for the ministry." If it had been up to Paul, there'd have been no John Mark. So it tells me that Barnabas was right. But here's what I think: I think Paul had a, a love problem. He, he didn't have a commitment problem, but he had a problem really being getting that softer side of, of just the love of God and letting grace work. And so who's the guy that writes first Corinthians 13? It's like kind of like sh- shucks, you know, love's not boastful. It's not arrogant. You know, it doesn't seek its own, you know, this God taught him and the very thing that was weak in him became a strength. He got it. He got it. So um, we need to understand that. Was that the devil working in Paul? Well, let's let's put it this way. It's the devil exploiting in Paul anything that he can find that's a weakness in him. And it's, it's principalities and powers at work. And a lot of these principalities and powers are actually working in us. Isn't that good news? But the, the, the reality is, is that we all have it. So we don't need to look and say, ew, look at them. Well, you know what? Let's just get that finger pointed back in the other direction as well. Everybody's, and just the fact that you did the ew, look at them, means you've got something. you got the same disease because, you know, we're in this thing together. We're pulling together to, to see the body of Christ be made whole. You say, is this, is this prayer and fasting? Oh, man, is it? You, you know, we're not going to get a lot of prayers answered unless some of this is really working in us and becoming strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Um, I know you probably get tired of me saying this, but I've, you know, I've pastored my whole life. I mean, this is all I've done is, is and, and to this church. Basically, I've spent my life here with you. And uh, the, the thing that, that I've noticed and I believe is the main thing that deters revival is a lack of ability of people just to walk together. Churches are not powerful unless the people there cohesify. I know you've probably never heard those words before, but I've got quite an extensive vocabulary that nobody else in the world knows. We need to cohesify. 
And um, I wonder if people on streaming know that I'm kidding. <laughs> Someone could be tuning in here. That guy is some kind of arrogant jerk. It knows everything. Um, that was a joke. Okay. Anyway. Um, so, it's, you know, if, if we want to see powerful things, and I, I don't think it's just here, it's the body of Christ as a whole. But I, my take on it has been, if, you, if we can't accomplish it here, how do we say, we just need to be unified with the body of Christ, but we're not unified. We want to unify with the people down the street and love them and join with them and shout, lift our hands and dance before the Lord. And yet, can we make it here amongst us where the rubber meets? Can our families make it? Can our families make it? That even when we go through uh, traumatic things, can we still make it? I believe we're the body of Christ. We should be able to make it in anything if we want to. So... Um, very important. So we're taking the shield of faith, we're quenching the fiery darts of the wicked one, and we do it for one another. We stand in the gap. We believe. Um, we take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So again, we're back to understanding the Word, and, the, and that Word becomes an offensive weapon. Not only was I quenching the fiery darts of the wicked one over April, but I was taking the sword of the Spirit and cutting the he devil's head off. You're not sticking around my house there. You don't, you don't get to stay here and, and do whatever you want to do. Are you kidding me? That's not going to happen here. Long term, the devil doesn't win. He may win some skirmishes along the way here and there. Have, have any, anybody here lost a few skirmishes? Well, don't quit, though, because you are dealing with a defeated foe. You just have to keep exerting what you know to be true, using the sword of the Spirit. Keep wielding the thing. You say, well, I've tried so what are you going to do? Put your sword down and let him start wielding the sword? But I'm tired. Join the rest of the world. Then he says in verse 18, praying always. Praying always. Can you say that out loud? Say praying always. Praying always. I'm going to just say it out loud. Say praying always. Praying so this is something we do all the time. Praying always with what? With all prayer. There's all kinds of prayer. Prayer of faith, prayer of commitment, prayer of dedication, prayer of praise. You know, people don't really realize this, but when you worship, you're praying. It's a form of prayer. And it's one of my favorite. How about you? I just love to worship and to praise God and, and to give Him honor. But we pray with all kinds of prayer. And what? supplication in the spirit now the word supplication is not a difficult word it's it kind of if you think about it it sounds like the supplicate means to do it all the time you keep doing it and you go back over and over and over again you keep going and how do you do it in the spirit you supplicate in the spirit so what does that mean it means to speak in tongues <laughs> it means that you pray in tongues you said, well, it didn't say that. It said praying in the Spirit. Well, the same guy that wrote this is the one that says, I'll do two things. I will pray in the Spirit. I'll pray with my understanding. I will sing in the Spirit, and I'll sing with my understanding. Now, I don't know about you. If, pray, if praying in the Spirit is not praying with your understanding, then what is it? It's praying in the Spirit. <laughs> There's two kinds of prayer going. There's prayer that I understand, and I'm, which is my understanding, and then there's prayer in the Spirit that I don't understand unless I interpret it. And what he said right here is that you supplicate in the Spirit. He said to do it all the time, praying always with all prayer. There's other kinds of prayer. And what? Supplicate all the time. Be praying all the time in the Spirit. That's praying in tongues. Praying in tongues. And of course, that, that chapter where he talks about praying in your understanding or praying in the Spirit is the great chapter about praying in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, that he that prays in tongues edifies himself. Makes sense that he talk about that here because he's talking about being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So how can I get strong in the Lord, power of his might? Get the word. We got that several times in here. 
sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, or, you know, rebuking all the fiery darts of the evil one, the gospel of peace, taking the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, uh, the, the breastplate of righteousness. All these things have to do with the Word of God. So the, the basic way to stay strong in the Spirit, and this is really deep, but the basic way to stay strong in the Spirit is to stay in the Word and to pray in tongues. It's real difficult, real hard. But we like hard things. You would rather me come with, I've got 25 ways for you to be strong in God and for me to give them all to you. <laughs> I love Bob Crow. He said he's going to write a book someday, 25 ways how to be strong in the Lord and how I did it in five. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's not that hard to, to do this. It's profound, and it's not hard. It just takes commitment. And we purposely have for decades encouraged our church to do what we're entering in on this Monday, is to eliminate distractions. And what a lot of you will find out after you go through withdrawals and you're not on Facebook, <laughs> you, you just can't, <laughs> what do I do with my thumbs? You know, my dad told me one time, my dad smoked all of his life from forever. I mean, I went to school smelling like uh, camel cigarettes. I didn't know it. You know, everybody, I, I think, smoked back then, by our whole house, and we smoked in the house three packs a day. And um, um, he had emphysema and just very virile, athletic person, and he becomes, you know, just kind of lost. Well, he never was very big. But uh, he quit smoking, gained 30 pounds, looked better. Now he, and he was like probably in his 60s. He looked better than he did when he was 40. It was amazing. And then he started smoking again. And I saw him just go, whew, just. And I said, well, why did you start back up again? He said, it's not so much the nicotine, it's my fingers. I, want, I need to have something to do with my hands. And he said, I was always just trying to figure out what to do with my hands. He said, so I just started back again. And some of you are going to do that with your. <laughs> you know, well, just stick them in your pocket. Hold on and pray. <laughs> just start praying. Let it go. And, and see if you can't get free of that thing. <laughs> anyway, supplicate in the spirit. Being watchful. Some of you, I'm saying that. And you're looking at me going. And you, you, what's that one that you have to around a gun? You have to twi take my, before you're going to get my gun, you'll have to twist them off my cold, dead fingers off the trigger or something like that. Some of you are going to be like that. We'll find you. <laughs> you can't have it. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Being watchful to the end. And then, you know, he, the part that we'll end with here tonight, I was going to talk about being bold and praying for the ministers, but he, let's just stop here. He, he says, um, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You know, one of our big jobs, and I, we do this. If you, you know, I know, well, there's only a few people that come to 8 o'clock prayer, and I get it. I understand people got to go to work and do stuff. But we do it on um, every morning in prayer, and on that Thursday night, we spend time praying for you, praying for this body, praying for the people of God. Because the Bible tells us to, to supplicate for the saints. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. If I'm supposed to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, and you're supposed to be strong in the Lord, the power of His might. The body of Christ, this church, right here, is supposed to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. You watching over streaming tonight, you're to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. The church is, so I, this is me, and maybe this is my pastoral side coming out. I pray first for the body of Christ, then the world. 
Because my conviction is if the body of Christ is strong and the power of his might, the world will take care of itself because we will be strong, we will be powerful, we will witness, they will see. And I think the world is looking for that. I think where we are right now is we are in a... in. In my lifetime, I've never seen America so pessimistic toward God, toward the things of God, and I think the church in general, a pessimism um, about what they, what they see, and what they need to see is a church that's powerful and vibrant and full of love, accepting, but yet have a standard. I don't think they really want a wishy-washy, anything-goes place. You say, well, I hear them out there saying that is what they want. Well, not really. Not really. Because no one gets helped. No one gets any help if there is not a standard. We hold a standard up that we can try to hit in the power of God. Not on our own. Not in our own strength. We don't do this in our own strength. We don't even pray in our own strength. We, we are strong in the Lord and the power of His might. We're not doing this. We don't have any might. It's Him. And so I pray first for you. And I pray first for the church to see God make it strong that the world will see. Because Jesus said this is what the world is looking for. That the world wants to see us united according to John 17. And they will see a love in us that will make them believe that the Father has sent Jesus. Wow. So we've got prayer coming up. You say, what did you preach this for tonight? Because I want you to come pray. Amen. Well, say, I pray at home. You're a liar. <laughs> that always goes over big. But I'm not, okay, I'll soften it just a little bit. Okay, you probably do pray at home, but you will never pray at home like you would here. I don't believe that. I don't believe people tend to pray as much as we sometimes think that we do. And when we gather together, it just helps us. It helps us in prayer when we gather. So I want to encourage you. you got a lot of opportunities. Three times a day, Monday through Friday, you get to do it once on Saturday. You come to church on Sunday and shout and go home. We're still going to let you sleep on Sunday afternoon. What a good, loving church we are. <laughs> right? So um, that's the call. I want to call you seriously call you to join us for this time of prayer i think it's going to be awesome it's going to be powerful and if anybody else believes it why don't you just stand up for a moment and we might break a record tonight it's only 8 34 i feel backslidden lord tonight come on let's just how about we can do this for a little bit let's just supplicate in the spirit just, just lift your voice up and let's just pray in the Spirit for a little bit. Let's break yourself in. You see, the more you pray in the Spirit, you, the stronger that you get. Because when you pray in the Spirit, what do you do? You edify yourself. So pray in other tongues. Just keep praying, but listen to this. Why do I do that? The Lord told me 30... Hmm... 36 years ago, never to compromise the baptism of the Spirit. And what I've seen...